uh, this school of the uh, very interesting and interdisciplinary uh, ITN project. So uh, when I decided what was the most uh, appropriate uh, subject for this lecture, I thought that um, the use of photosynthetic um, microorganisms, of materials derived from photosynthetic microorganisms, which is a really a new research area, could have been interesting for this audience. It is actually a, a really interdisciplinary subject uh, where uh, chemists, biologists, photophysicists um, have to uh, talk each other and develop a common language uh, to develop a new class of materials which may be, I mean, it's not clear what's going to be the impact of this research. It's a very new uh, uh, research subject, but uh, interesting inspiration are coming from them. So uh, <coughs> I thought it would uh, be interesting uh, for me to share with you and hopefully for you to listen to uh, something relevant to this subject, which I'm also involved in um, with my research group uh, starting from uh, five, six years. So basically, what uh, is coming up from different research groups uh, all around the world is that it is possible to use uh, materials and uh, components of photosynthetic organisms uh, as active materials or as components of uh, electronics and photonic uh, systems and devices. In this case, the use of light as source of energy is not only uh, because those components are able uh, to convert light into energy, into charges, because they have been evoluted by nature to do so and to uh, basically interact with light. But also the production of material itself is generated by light because it ultimately derives from photosynthetic processes. The photosynthesis in the uh, plants and in uh, photosynthetic microorganisms is the process converting light into the metabolic uh, cycles which ultimately uh, result not only the production of carbohydrates and everything, but also in the entire energy fueling the uh, photosynthetic organism also to produce other structures which are relevant to uh, the uh, uh, evolution of those organisms and to their interaction with light. These are two examples. Uh, these are two examples where um, actually in two research groups, one is my research group and the other is a research group in Sweden, uh, we are both involved in a, uh, a FET open European project relevant to the use of photosynthetic organisms for uh, production of components for electronics. In the case of the group in Sweden, they are using part of the plants, of the leaves essentially, um, as a, the uh, template for building uh, circuits for uh, organic bioelectronics. While in our case, we are using microorganisms as essentially bacteria and microscopic algae to produce in one case uh, materials for uh, bioelectronic devices for photoconversion and in the other case components for photonics. So um, essentially um, this is a, a very uh, synthetic um, uh, time scale of the evolution of organic electronics which have been largely uh, determined by development of materials. I'm a synthetic chemist, so the perspective of this lecture is essentially uh, reasoning about uh, the possibility opened by designing and synthesizing materials in the production of energy through the sunlight. So essentially, uh, the organic electronics uh, started with uh, the possibility of building the first uh, solar cells made out of uh, organometallic materials like uh, copper thalocyanides, but then also organometallic complexes were used for LED devices as nonlinear optics materials, as uh, material for phos phos phosphorescent um, uh, electroluminescent devices. And more recently, heterocyclic chemists has been uh, playing a big role in the um, production of polymers for plastic solar cells and uh, also for uh, modern organic light emitting driven transistors 
and also impacting on the possibility of using photonics in biomedicine. So the uh, growth and development of organic electronics and uh, exploitation of organic materials for uh, energy collection and conversion has been, of course, largely determined by our possibility and ability of designing new materials. This has resulted in uh, a big impact on technology with uh, the uh, growth of an entire new technological field called plastic electronics and also the possibility of using on um, scaling down electronics uh, to uh, the molecular scale with uh, the molecular electronics. Some classes of materials that have been developed over the years, uh, I've chosen examples from my work, but I mean, they are quite general classes of materials. For electroluminescent devices, uh, where uh, uh, electrical energy is converted into light, these are conjugated polymers or organometallic complexes. A lot of work has been done, as I said, on uh, conjugated polymers for plastic solar cells, which are essentially based on heterocyclic structures or molecules for uh, organic electronic devices. The literature is impressive in terms of optimiz optimization of materials based on molecular design, and in most cases, the performances are the first goal, and sometimes there is a paid uh, uh, not that much attention to the cost of materials. So in many cases, for instance, in plastic solar cells development, the literature has pointed out that many uh, many polymers which are reported in the literatures as record polymers in terms of efficiency for conversion of solar light into energy are actually materials which are just academic materials because there is no possibility to scale up those materials to industrial production because their cost would be much, much more than the cost that can be afforded by companies to produce those um, materials and devices on a practical uh, scale. So uh, the problem of making materials and incorporating in the molecular design of materials not only the efficiency but also the scalability and the synthetic feasibility is a major issue where organic chemists, synthetic chemists are of course playing a major role and all the people involved in this field should be conscious that designing materials means not only targeting efficiency but also targeting feasibility in terms of cost and environmental impact of production. So um, there are several research groups uh, who started to uh, be interested in the possibility of using biological materials or biomimetic materials as a source of materials for uh, optoelectronic devices and for devices for conversion of light into energy. For instance, just to mention some examples of those materials, melanins have been considered um, as polymers for optoelectronic devices or for uh, memory devices. Melanins means both melanins that can be extracted from organisms, so natural melanins, but also mimics of melanins that can be used very easily in laboratory by polymerization, oxidative polymerization of dopamine. Another example is silk, which can be produced on a large scale and also doped. This is a fantastic material which has many interesting photonic properties and a very high level of compatibility. And uh, it can be also functionalized in many interesting ways. Another example is cellulose, um, which of course is a very abundant material and is also uh, prone to easy fu chemical functionalization. It has been, it is been uh, demonstrated that cellulose can be used for a fabrication of organic and bioorganic optoelectronic devices, both as uh, an inert support but also as an active material, it's proper functionalized. So this is the framework and here came uh, the uh, question that uh, our group and also other groups worldwide are now um, investigating the, 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 the point that is now investigated and the point that I would like to discuss with you today. Can we envisage a bi general biotechnological route to optoelectronic and photonic materials from photosynthetic organisms and in my case I would say from photosynthetic microorganisms for what we are going to discuss today. Essentially uh, photosynthetic organisms are organisms which have been evoluted by nature over billions of years to be able to interact with light, 
to collect light, to convert this light very, efficient, very efficiently into chemical energy. So essentially, they have all the optimized machinery, uh, which is very difficult to uh, mimic, of course, because it's, as, as I said, optimized in billions of years, for interaction with light and for conversion of light into several forms of energy. And they are there already. What I mean is that they are themselves produced by uh, absorption of light. So they are themselves materi materials made out from a process where the ultimate source of energy is sunlight. If you look at the structure that uh, the microorganisms, photosynthetic microorganisms, uh, have developed for interaction of light, with your eyes of uh, synthetic chemists who have been involved, as I did for uh, 20 years of my scientific activity, in developing, designing, uh, optimizing artificial materials for interaction with light, which means materials able to collect light and convert light into energy, or the opposite, uh, convert energy, electrical energy, into light. Then uh, you feel like Alice in the Wonderland. There is in front of you a wonderful, immense uh, source of structures, materials, systems that are already there uh, waiting to be um, exploited or to be extracted for being used uh, in our devices or for being treated as materials, as we did uh, with the artificial materials that we have been synthesizing for many years in our synthetic laboratories. Essentially, I will discuss <coughs> this possibility with two examples, um, which are partially taken by uh, the work that uh, we have been carried out recently in my research group, but also partially taken from the literature, because we have been not the only ones considering this possibility. So essentially, we'll discuss uh, the use of photosynthetic bacteria and photoenzymes extracted from photosynthetic bacteria as active material in optoelectronic and photonic devices. And if we have time enough I'll, after this part, I will shortly discuss about the use of diatoms, microalgae, uh, photonic structures as materials for photonics. Of course, uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm discussing those two subjects uh, as a synthetic chemist. So for me, those uh, microorganisms are just a source of materials that I want to extract and purify and modify and eventually test into devices. This is a largely interdisciplinary subject, so a microbiologist would discuss this point in completely different terms. A physicist and a photophysicist would be the same. So. Uh, I'm discussing this with my language, which may be not a perfect one, but this makes also the game very stimulating uh, from my point of view. So let's start with uh, photosynthetic bacteria, and particularly what we have done for production and extraction from photosynthetic bacteria or photoenzymes that we have eventually tested as photoactive material in optoelectronic devices for solar energy conversion. Before starting, I would invite you to consider this uh, like an extension of an approach which is very mature in uh, pharmaceutical chemistry, for example. In pharmaceutical chemistry, it is, of course, well known that you produce some drugs like antibiotics from fermentation processes. You extract them from the microorganism. Eventually, you can modify the molecules with uh, synthetic processes to optimize their performances. But uh, it's very uh, uncommon that the same approach is used in materials chemistry. So it's kind of a new paradigm. The bacterium that we have used is Rod Rhodobacter spheroides. I'm going to explain how Rhodobacter spheroides photosynthetic apparatus is done, because it may be not obvious for those in the audience who are not familiar with photosynthetic organisms. Rhodobacter spheroides is a very simple uh, red bacterium, non-oxygenic bacterium. It is uh, very well known uh, and very well uh, investigated because it's uh, a model system for photosynthetic process, because it's very easy to be cultivated in a laboratory, to be chemically, to be sorry, genetically modified. And it, is also, it has also a very simple photosynthetic apparatus, so it's uh, not so difficult to, let's say, disassemble the photosynthetic apparatus, which would be much more challenging in the case of higher plants or uh, superior photosynthetic organisms. 
in a very uh, schematic way, uh, we, can, we can say that the uh, entire system for collection of light and production of the first high energy chemicals that eventually fuel the entire photosynthetic machinery is all embedded into the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane and you can see all these colored structures which are um, a very schematic way to represent the photosynthetic unit. The photosynthetic unit is the part of the photosynthetic apparatus which will collect light and convert light into charge separated states which are then used to fuel the biochemical part of the photosynthetic system. So um, we can uh, envisage this photosynthetic unit as made of three components, the light harvesting complex one, the green, the light harvesting complex two, the red, and the reaction center. This is an example of how they are organized into the, into the membrane and then the energy is uh, eventually conveyed to the ATP synthesis uh, complex. So um, they are uh, organized in a very precise way. The light harvesting complex is one and two, which means the green and the red objects are protein pigment complexes where uh, the pigments, essentially chlorophylls and carotenoids, are kept in the proper orientation and position by uh, the uh, protein part, by the enzymes. While the uh, blue object uh, is the reaction center, which is the actual photoconverter. I mean, it is a photoenzyme where the uh, photons collected by the light harvesting complexes one and two are uh, converted into charge separated states. This is a closer view where you can see that the entire system is a complex supramolecular arrangement which has to be kept in the proper position to work, otherwise uh, it, simply it simply won't work. So ideally, if we could take the system out of the cell membrane and put this onto an electrode or into an optoelectronic device, this would be an ideal system for conversion of um, photons into charged separated states because the system is able to convert photons into uh, electron all couples with about 100% efficiency. Uh, this is not easy because, uh, as I said, that's a very delicate supramolecular system. So if we just take it out from the cell membrane and put on an electrode, it would be a quite a brutal approach which would not work because the system is subject to continuous photodegradation. So uh, in the living system, the antenna complex is comp continuously replaced, but it can't be done, of course, uh, when we take it, the system out of, from the cell membrane. However, on the contrary, the, photo the reaction center, which is the actual photoenzyme in charge of conversion of photons into charge separated states, is a quite robust system. It can be extracted from the cell membrane uh, it can be kept in solution if provided that you keep it in the presence of a tensioactive which maintain uh, the system uh, in solution, preventing its precipitation. Then it can be uh, handled and keep alive and active for weeks or even for months. So it's, it's a very robust system. Let's uh, say in a very few words how the system is done. Because of course this is a very complex transmembrane protein so if we have a look at the proteic structure, it may be a little bit, I mean, confusing. We are trying to uh, minimize the complexity and to explain how the system works in a very simple words. So let's imagine that the entire uh, proteic scaffold is just a scaffold, just a kind of, of a basket where the actual cofactors responsible of the generation of the charge separated states are maintained. So the proteic scaffold is made of uh, three subunits, M, L, and H, which basically create a basket. The L and uh, the uh, M subunits are doing, uh, are, are, uh, are shaped like a cylinder, which a cavity inside, and an hydrophobic surface. And the bottom is closed by this H subunit, which is a globular protein. So overall, it's a kind of a container. It's uh, properly oriented into the cell membrane with uh, this part, which is a cavity um, uh, facing the periplasmatic side, while the part which is closed uh, is faces into the cytoplasmatic side. And into the cavity, uh, we have the cofactors, which are the actual system responsible of the generation of charge separated states. Uh, let's have a look at this very simplified cartoon, 
where we observe that those cofactors, which are in fact quite complex structure, are simplified to the, their key components. So we have two bacteriochlorophyll molecules, which are arranged in a functional dimers, uh, two, bacterio, two isolated bacteriochlorophyll molecules, two bacteriophyophytin, which is the same as bacteriochlorophyll but without the central magnesium cation, two ubiquinone molecule, and one non-eme iron 2 plus cation. So essentially when the excited, when the, the photons are absorbed by the light harvesting complex, the excited state is generated on this bacteriochlorophyll dimer, which is the primary energy acceptor. And then a cascade of electron transfer processes takes place, bringing the electron from the primary uh, electron acceptor to the last electron acceptor, which is a quinone molecule. And this generates a charge separated states, which is of course uh, a huge dipole, into the cavity of the protein. And essentially what is very interesting is that this charge separated state is a long living charge separated state. It, it lasts from one to three seconds. Uh, if you keep the system without the natural electron acceptor and electron donor, which in the living system would immediately quench these charge separated states. But if you keep it uh, out of the system, it will uh, produce this charge separated state, which is a long living charge separated state. As I said, in the cell, this is fueling the photocycle, which means that uh, the hole generated on, in the excited state on the uh, functional dimer will be used to oxidize the cytochrome, while the electron will be released in the form of the reduced quinone into uh, the internal environment of the cell, thus creating the uh, transmembrane pH gradient, which is the fuel of the ATPase enzyme. So, uh, the idea was, uh, can we demonstrate that this photoenzyme uh, can be used outside the cell to uh, generate uh, charge separated states which can be eventually exploited into optoelectronic devices? Uh, of course, if you have a look at the absorption spectrum of the reaction center, there are entire part of the absorption spectrum which are not covered by, uh, by the sunlight, of course. Yeah. And this is because the system has been evoluted in nature not to uh, absorb light because it's always associated with the light harvesting complexes one and two, but it has been evoluted just to convert the photons absorbed by the light harvesting system. But as I said, we can't take the light harvesting complexes out of the cell membrane because they are labile. So to, do, to make the system work, we should replace all these complexes with very simple molecules, the same synthetic molecule that we use, for instance, for production of polymers for plastic solar cells, small organic molecules, provided that they match well with the absorption spectrum of the reaction center, and provided that we are, we are able to locate those molecules, to affix those molecules in the proper position on the proteic scaffold in order to give energy transfer to the primary energy acceptor. So um, we started our investigation as a proof of principle. We thought, okay, let's try with a very simple molecule that can absorb light here where there is no absorption in the spectrum of the reaction center and that can emit light where there is a maximum of absorption in the uh, absorption spectrum of the reaction center. And let's see if there is any kind of energy transfer. If we can, at least in principle, at that wavelength precisely, 450 nanometers, replace the antenna system with an artificial molecule. So we started with this very simple building block, which we had in our laboratories, because this is a very classical building block. It's a bistyophen benzotiadiazole building block that is largely used as a monomer for uh, the production of polymers for plastic solar cells. I'm not going to uh, 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 give you synthetic details, because I don't know if there are synthetic chemists in the audience, and it could be extremely... Uh, I mean, boring maybe for other people uh, to listen to uh, synthetic details. But I want to point out that this is a very important part of the work, although I'm not going to discuss it into details. But just to share with you the logic of design of the molecule, why we choose this structure? Because it, it has a good absorption spectrum, more or less matched with uh, the minimum of absorption spectrum of the reaction center. It has a good emission, which is located where the relative absorption of the reaction center takes place. And it has also um, a good stoke shift. We can modulate 
the position by extending the conjugated system in order to match exactly with the absorption spectrum of the reaction center. So we end out with a molecule which has an extended conjugation, but we also need a flexible spacer because the molecule is, is a rigid rod molecule. So if we just attach the molecule to the protein without a, a, a spacer, it will intercalate into the alpha helix of the protein. It, it will denaturate the protein. The denaturation of protein is a major issue if you want to use protein as active materials in uh, optoelectronic devices. And of course, we need a, a reactive unit that is able to covalently attach the molecule to precise position of the protein. This is engineering the position where you want to have the molecules attached in order to have, in order to have energy transfer to the, to the um, photoenzyme. So you see there is a good matching of the absorption and emission, and we can carry out the chemistry to attach our antenna using a very simple uh, amide bond formation that will covalently affix the antenna molecule to the lysine residues of the protein. There are precise positions which are indicated here as these blue uh, dots, which are the amino groups. We know exactly where the amino groups are in the protein, so we know exactly where we are eventually going to bind the antenna molecule on the protein. And some of those positions are very useful because they are very close to the primary energy acceptor. We, what we did is to confirm that we in fact had functionalized the protein in the proper position. So we could crystallize the photoenzyme, which was not very simple. These are the crystals of the native enzyme and these are the crystals of the bioconjugated system. And uh, upon collecting um, uh, X-ray data at the synchrotron facility in Grenoble, we could uh, figure out to have um, a map of the position where the photoenzyme is, where the antenna is located. And for instance, we could demonstrate that this lysine residues has been functionalized, which means that the antenna is close enough to the primary energy acceptor and also to the secondary energy acceptor to give forced energy transfer. So the, this small organic molecule replacing the huge uh, antenna system can be attached in a proper position to collect light and give energy transfer to the reaction center. We can see a partial quenching of emission upon energy transfer. We can see a change in the fluorescent lifetime decay, which indicates that effective energy transfer is occurring and that so forced energy transfer is a possible uh, mechanism for uh, uh, transferring energy to the reaction center. What we find is that this is the absorption spectrum of the native reaction center, the blue one. The red one is the spectrum of the functionalized reaction center. So clearly there is an absorption here at 450 nanometers where the native system does not absorb, which is due to the absorption of the antenna molecule. And if we measure the generation, the concentration of charge separated state shining light at 450 nanometers, where only the functionalized system can absorb light, we see a five-fold increase in the concentration of charge separated states, which is the final proof of the effective energy transfer we have effectively replaced the antenna system with this monochromatic absorber at 450 nanometers. This is just a proof of principle, of course, because we want to replace all the wavelength, to, to have absorption in all the wavelength of the absorption spectrum. So we need different molecules. And here we started to play, I mean, our game, because as I said, I'm a synthetic organic chemist. So we did a lot of molecules uh, able to absorb light into the entire visible spectrum and transferring this energy to the primary energy acceptor. I'm not going to discuss this part because I would just to discuss the principles behind it. And I will show you just the final results out of one out of 10, 15 molecules that we have done. This is a cyanine molecule. It's a quite a complex structure. It is water soluble, which is important if you want to play with enzymes. Especially, again, we see this uh, reactive unit that you use to attach the antenna to the lysine residues. And as you can see, this molecule has a wide absorption spectrum. Uh, so in this case, just shining white light and not monochromatic light, we could uh, determine an increase of 90% uh, of the generation of charge separated states comparing the native photoenzyme with the functionalized photoenzyme. So essentially, it's kind of replacing uh, the uh, antenna complex with a simple molecule. This is eventually an hybrid system which uh, 
uh, is working against the entire uh, photosystem, but only the reaction center is the natural component, and the other component, the antenna, is a small, simple, let's say simple, uh, artificial antenna. So now what we have, what we want to do with this, uh, um, with this uh, photoenzyme, because of course having the enzyme just floating in solution is completely useless. We want to have the enzyme uh, as an active material in a device. And the question is, can we use uh, this um, reaction, functionalized reaction center uh, uh, on an electrode to do to do that, we need to address somehow the reaction center on, on the electrode because, uh, of course, that's not trivial. It's very easy to denaturate a protein. So we, had, we tested various approaches, which are essentially examples of approaches taken from the literature that have been previously used to attach enzymes to electrodes or, for instance, to, the, to graphene layer or in any way to uh, semiconductors that are able to interface uh, a system able to produce charge separated states with an ele electronic circuitry. So in the case of graphene, we used a very simple approach uh, that had been previously reported for uh, functionalizing carbon nanotubes with glucose oxidase molecules. In this case, pi pi is taking interaction between pyrene molecules and graphene layers are used, and this is a spacer and then a malamide group, and the malamide group can react with the only accessible system on the protein. So in this case, since there is only one accessible amino acid with SH group, so we know exactly where the protein has been, uh, where is the chemical link to attach the protein to the substrate. So this is nice, but this is just a picture, in my opinion. Uh, we of, of course, we characterize the system, but uh, this is the way it's uh, commonly represented in the literature when an enzyme is attached, for instance, to carbon nanotubes. But that's simply not true, because the, the highly hydrophobic surface of the protein will interact with the hydrophobic surface of graphene. So most likely, those photoenzyme molecules will be lying flat on the surface rather than just standing up on it. So. Um, we went to more uh, classical approach, at least more familiar for me as, as a synthetic organic chemist. So what we did is again using lysine residues and using a bifunctional spacer. One of the, uh, on the end of this spacer is reacting with lysine and the other is um, an azido group which opens up interesting possibilities in uh, uh, creating, easily creating covalent bonds. So we use this uh, azido group to react with triple bond attached on graphene flakes uh, doing click chemistry and so we functionalize these graphene oxide flakes with the enzyme using the spacer that I've shown you. Of course it's not elegant as the one I showed you before because in that case we had only one amino acid so we know exactly where the protein is, like, is bound to the, to the um, graphene but it is much more effective. Uh, the most interesting results were obtained by using hydrogen bonded organic semiconductors. These very simple molecules have been demonstrated by the group of Serdar Saricivci in Linz to be uh, very effective semiconductors. Uh, they uh, bound each other in a very ordered way through hydrogen bonds, so they are very simple, they can be casted in a very simple way, but especially they work in aqueous condition, which is um, a, requisite, a requisite to use the materials uh, in, in, uh, when you want to use an enzyme. And also, especially from our point of view, they have this nitrogen atom that can be functionalized uh, using the chemistry as I shown you before. So this is the linker. Again, you can see the two activated carboxylic group. One end is reacting with this nitrogen atom, the other end is reacting with the lysine residues. So this is the scheme of a very simple resistive device. Two gold electrodes, a thin layer of the semiconductor is the epindiolidinone semiconductor. As I said, it works in water. This is an AFM picture showing the multicrystalline surface. We first react the system with the spacer and then we use the uh, reactive end of the spacer to attach the reaction center molecule. So at the end we have the uh, surface of the semiconductor uh, on the electrode completely functionalized with the reaction center and working in water. This is a resistive device. So if we shine light at uh, 600 nanometers where no absorption takes place in the 
organic semiconductors, but only the reaction center can absorb light. It generates the charge separated states and it can dope. First of all, we demonstrate that the enzyme is still active, so it has not been denaturated. And uh, you point shining light, essentially the enzyme is photosensitizing the organic semiconductor. So it's, it's creating charge separated state, which can eventually dope the organic semiconductor. So it's acting like uh, uh, an enzymatic photosensitizer. And you can see photocurrents on and off, upon shining light on and off. And since the system is covalently functionalized, then you can uh, uh, get uh, the electrode uh, stable even after washing many times with different solutions. So it's a proof of principle that we can uh, photosensitize the surface, so it's, it's basically a photoconductor device basing, based on the use of a photoenzyme. But we can also go to a kind of a more sophisticated device uh, which can be uh, also uh, light driven by the use of uh, uh, the uh, reaction center. Uh, this is a field effect transistor. I, I think most of you in the audience knows as a field effect, an organic field effect transistor is done. But anyway, I'm going to show a very simplified cartoon. We have a conductive silicon substrate, a dielectric with two electrodes on top of it, and a thin layer of the organic semiconductor. Uh, the source electrode is grounded, and uh, then we have a gate electrode, which uh, where the, this conductive silicon substrate is biased against the source uh, electrode, and this is gating the device. So if we apply, if we apply a voltage um, between the gate and the source electrode, um, charges are collected at the very first interface between the organic semiconductors and the dielectric. So this is the channel. And depending on the intensity of this voltage, we can accumulate uh, uh, an increasing amount of charges. So essentially, once we apply the voltage between the source and gate electrodes, we have uh, that the current flowing between those two electrodes is modulated by the gate electrode. And these are the classical IVO curves of uh, an organic field effect transistor device. So this is a very simplified cartoon. As I said, I'm not a device physicist. But it's useful to understand how um, an electrolyte gate organic transistor works. In an electrolyte gated organic transistor, essentially, the semiconductive channel here is exposed to an electrolyte whose potential is fixed by the gate dielectric. So essentially, the device is gated by the solution. And the gate electrode is this electrode into the, into the electrolyte solution. So, to, what, so what we want to do uh, is to um, use the light as the um, external stimulus to trigger and to modulate the current flowing into the device. So this would have been uh, a light-gated transistor. To do so, we need to accumulate our reaction center right here uh, attached to a transparent ITO electrode. And this is the channel. But to make the system work, we need to have the reaction center not only affixed on the electrode, but also oriented. So this is the, let's say, the uh, most challenging point. Because if we have the uh, dipoles randomly oriented, of course, they will cancel each other. So you will, you will not observe any effect. So how can we orient the reaction center protein? It's a delicate object. It's not easy to orient. We can, explain, we can exploit again uh, its biological role. As I said, in nature, the system is uh, conceived to be reduced after, being, after having been photoexcited by the cytochrome. So if we randomly deposit the cytochrome C on the surface of the ITO electrode, only those cytochrome facing their selective docking site uh, on the upper side will be able to uh, to capture the reaction center and to keep the reaction center by weak supramolecular interaction in the proper orientation. So this is the way we, um, we uh, uh, addressed the reaction center molecules on the surface of the ITO electrode. So again, the device architecture. We have the two source and drain electrode here and here. This is the uh, channel, which is made out of a pentacin, functionalized pentacin organic semiconductor. Uh, then this is the light sensitive unit, ITO, oxidized cytochrome used to address the, the reaction center. This is the reaction center. And this is how the device is, is assembled. So essentially, by shining light, we generate dipoles in the reaction center, which are oriented. 
they generate an asymmetric distribution of ions into the solution. And this distribution of ions determine an accumulation of negative charges at the interface with the channel, which eventually will dope the channel and modulate the current. So what we see is that uh, in this transistor device, we are modulating the light on and off, and also the intensity of the, of the current flowing between these two electrodes by shining light and by exciting the reaction center. So this is an, ulti an ultimate demonstration of the possibility of using the reaction center, which is a protein, a complex transmembrane protein from a photosynthetic organism, as an active material able to generate a new kind of device where the transistor is photogated. And of course, the photogating is only visible when the reaction center is on there and when it is properly oriented. Otherwise, we don't observe any response to light. So to conclude this part, this part of the talk, um, the reaction center can be functionalized. To, first of all, it can be produced on a large scale because this is a bacterium. So it can be produced by fermentative process, also in a large scale. This is a way to produce materials uh, which otherwise had to be done by classical synthetic chemistry. Reaction center can be functionalized to enhance light absorption, can be covalently fixed on organic semiconductor film, can be oriented on electrode surface, and can be used as active material in bioelectronic devices. This is a proof of principle. I mean, I'm not telling you that tomorrow we're going to produce uh, on industrial scale uh, uh, electronics based on uh, these photoenzymes, because this is not true, at least at, at the moment. But this was the same kind of things that I would have seen 30 years uh, ago, talking about the possibility of uh, making electronic devices on a commercial scale out of organic semiconductors. The community of engineers would have been extremely skeptic. And I, personal, I personally experienced that when I was a PhD student presenting the results about organic polymers in photovoltaics, in uh, uh, electroluminescence in front of audience of engineers. They were skeptics because of the instability of materials. And this would be the same uh, issue in the case of biological materials. But for sure, this is something is worth to be investigated. Let me use the first, I guess, 10 minutes of my presentation to show you something different, which is more simple, but which goes in the same direction of using photosynthetic components to uh, uh, make uh, materials for photonics out of them. In this case, the um, uh, organisms that we have used uh, are um, diatoms microalgae. Diatoms are unicellular algae which are ubiquitously diffused in fresh water and ocean. They are everywhere there is a wet environment. Uh, and there are 10 to hundreds, thousand species of diatoms that have been demonstrated uh, and they are characterized by having their cell encased into uh, a silica shell um, wall. And this silica shell is actually not pure silica, but this silica is a kind of a composite made of silica and the polyamine uh, systems. I uh, made myself aware of the existence of those uh, wonderful uh, living structures because I was attending a discussion of a, PhD, uh, of a PhD thesis in environmental science where a student had used diatoms uh, as a, an environmental probe to collect the, the situation of pollution of a river um, in, a, in my region, in a, in a very polluted town, uh, Taranto, close to uh, close to the place where I live, where I used it to live. And they were using diatoms to, um, to the structure of those cells to check the um, uh, pollution by heavy metals into the river. Uh, at the same time, I was working on uh, silica nanostructures obtained via synthetic chemistry fa um, doped with um, light-emitting organic molecules. So I was particularly sensitive to the <coughs> chemical method for the production of uh, a controlled production of silica nanostructures. And I was amazed uh, when I realized how beautiful those systems are. And the features are on the nanoscale. The entire shell is on the micron scale, but the, the features on the silica are on the nanoscale. And they are uh, different for different species of diatoms. Each of them have their specific uh, and particular um, uh, uh, texture and structure of the pores, which are very well uh, uh, regularly distributed on the, on the surface. 
There are many biological um, uh, hypotheses about the role of these uh, silica shells. Of course, they, uh, they are used by the cells for protection uh, against predators, for sorting food particles, for protecting the cell against uh, the intake of viruses, but especially they have a photonic role because um, these uh, very regular distribution of pores on the nanoscale generate uh, photonic nanostructures, which has something to do with the, the biological cycles of the cell. I'm not, I'm not going to, to go into details, but they somehow tell the cells the, the, the light elaboration coming from interaction of sunlight with those uh, nanostructures tells the cells when the moment is uh, to switch from asexuate reproduction to, sex, to sexuate reproduction. And it has to be with the elaboration of light. Um, I think it was a good idea. I thought it, it would have been a good idea to investigate the possibility of making uh, uh, nanostructured silica-based materials out of those cells. And when I went to the literature, I found out that I was not the first one considering this possibility, though there, there would have been a lot of work uh, still to do about, about this. Before going, I want to show you some microscopy uh, pictures of those cells, which are simply beautiful. And you can see um, in polarized microscopy uh, their nanostructures. These are taken from the web, uh, but then I will show you the, uh, the pictures of the, uh, some of the pictures taken from our laboratory. Um, This is a very classical picture because all those uh, silica nanostructures share a common feature, which is they are made of uh, essentially three components, uh, <coughs> which are an epitheca and an hypotheca, which are like petri uh, dishes uh, kept together by uh, a sort of belt, which is a girdle. And the nanostructure, which is, is a, as I said, is species specific, uh, is different on the epitheca on the hypotheca and on the girdle, keeping the two parts together. Uh, the advantages of this source of uh, nanostructural silica is that they can be easily uh, obtained by uh, breeding those uh, organisms, which is, of, by the way, very well known because there is a, a wide industrial production of diatoms because they are used as food for um, breeding fishes in, uh, in industrial uh, uh, cultivation of fish. Um, but moreover, there are huge um, accumulation of fossil diatoms, uh, which are not chemically pure because metathetic processes has changed their composition from biosilica to uh, essentially calcium carbonate or other oxides. So they still keep their nanostructural features, but the chemical composition is different. And they are also commercially available, of course. But we wanted to grow these cells in the laboratory. We did it, this with the help of uh, PhD students in biotechnology because we would not have been able to do so because we are chemists, synthetic chemists. And so these are some of the pictures of Thalassiosira vesflogi, one of the species that can be easily grown in a laboratory scale and uh, the laboratory of organic synthesis, as you can imagine, is not the, the easiest place to grow up diatoms, but in spite of that, they grow. And so we could get two grams of nanostructured biosilica per liter, just leaving the cells grow without doing anything contrary to the uh, synthetic production of biosilica. Or we can grow them in, uh, into uh, specific bioreactor systems. These are some pictures of the nanostructured features of the diatoms. This is not the most regular species, though it's the uh, easiest to cultivate. And then coming to the point, we can functionalize, of course, this biosilica, which is very easy because it's just silica. So we have all the chemical tools for the functionalization of silica by simply grafting uh, a, a silicon alkoxide units to the surface of activated silica. This is very easy. So we, uh, let's say, kill the diatoms. We remove all the organic matters by an acidic oxidative treatment. And then we can graft all the molecules we want. In this case, these are molecular semiconductors. So we end up with um, red emitting semiconductor functionalized uh, <coughs> microscopic dots with nanostructured features. What is more interesting is that uh, we can also do that in vivo, which means without doing chemistry on the silica shell previously extracted and purified, 
we can just dope uh, in vivo the system by adding certain molecules properly functionalized to the growing medium of the diatoms. For instance, we can dope the silica with iridium uh, and with the other uh, uh, main group metals uh, by simply adding uh, phosphorescent iridium complexes to the growing medium. And then we can extract the silica and also eventually uh, break down the silica shells and convert them to nanoparticles. So this is a very easy way to produce um, uh, uh, heavy metal doped silica nanoparticles by simply um, exploiting the solar sun, uh, the solar energy, sorry, which is uh, the uh, energy fuel for a growing algae, and they do all the work for us. Uh, it's interesting that we can also, instead of breaking them down as we did uh, for doing silica nanoparticles, we can also exploit their photonic structure. In this case, we have introduced this molecule, which is a blue emitter, functionalized with the silicon alkoxide group. The silicon alkoxide is the chemical message to tell the atoms, okay, I'm food, so please eat me. So at the end, it will enter the metabolic chain of the atoms and will be fixed into the silica shell. This is the diatom still alive. You can recognize the red emitting dots, which are uh, the um, uh, photosynthetic organelles, while the shell is uh, dyed blue by the, 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 our molecule. Then if you remove all the living matter, the molecule is still alive, I still, because it's embedded into the silica. These are, uh, these are measured, collected by Guglielmo Lanzani at T team in, uh, in Milano. This is the transmission map of a specific region of the diatoms. You can see that there is a, a gap in the transmission, which is not due to the absorption of the silica, but it's due to the, um, it's, it's kind of a photonic band gap due to the alternation, uh, the alternation of refractive index, regular alternation of refractive index into the, into the cell due to the silica and voids, silica and voids. And it depends on where you collect the data, of course, because it depends on the texture, on the alternation of silica and voids. If you do the same measurements on the silica that has been previously doped with the, the um, light emitting molecules, you can see the interaction of the light emission of the molecules with the photonic structure of the diatom. So the, the red one is the emission spectrum of a thin film of this pure molecule. The blue spectrum is the transmission spectrum of the diatom. The red spectrum is the, the emission spectrum of the diatom doped with the, the um, light emitting molecule. So you can see that all these part of the spectrum falling into the, um, into the uh, transmission gap has been cut. And we have also this part of the emission. So essentially we have modulated the emission of the light emitting molecules by the photonic structure of the diatoms. And this can be done only if you dope in vivo the diatoms, which means that the molecules are intimately embedded into the biosilica structure. Because if you just graft the molecule on the surface of the atoms, there is no difference between the emission spectrum of the molecule and of the uh, in, in, in solution and of the molecules grafted on the surface of the diatom. So overall, those systems can be considered like kind of hybrid system resulting from a combination of the uh, light emissive behavior of the molecule that we have used and of the photonic structure, the native photonic structure of the diatom. And this uh, led me to the conclusion. Um, what I wanted to uh, tell you in this lecture is, this, is that, um, I mean, I had, again, I had to decide as a synthetic chemist what I want to discuss with you today. And I thought, if I go there and I just start to tell about how we design and synthesize molecules, um, organic molecules, and they give you a lot of information about the organic synthesis method, that can be useful, but this would be probably more uh, fit for an audience of synthetic chemists. Since this is an interdisciplinary audience and you are a young community in, an, in, in a network going to investigate new approaches to system for solar energy production, I thought that making you aware of this work uh, going on in my laboratory, but in many other parts of the world, about the, the possibility of using photosynthetic organisms as material, as source of materials for um, some solar energy collection and conversion would have been useful. And so this is why I decided to share with you these results. Uh, since I've also presented the results from my research group, I would like to acknowledge them. 
uh, and also um, mention this uh, FETOM PEN project, which is essentially focusing on these hybrid electronics based on photosynthetic organisms. Just to, to tell you that is something which is also considered as an interesting uh, possibility uh, and not just an academic uh, work. And this is the group of Angela Agostiano and Massimo Trotta, uh, who are the experts of photophysics of uh, photosynthetic protein. And uh, for the devices, we have collaborated with the group of Fabio Biscarini in Modena, because as I said, this, this is something that can only come from interaction uh, of totally different competencies. Uh, otherwise, it would not then be possible to do anything. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if I uh, understand well what you what you mean. Uh, if, if you you are uh, wondering if there is a way to uh, uh, prevent photodegradation. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that's an interesting point. I mean, um, if you mean preventing photodegradation, for sure there are possibilities. Uh, by <coughs> essentially, it's it's photodegradation, but it's also an oxidative photodegradation. So, uh, either capturing oxygen by antioxidants or encapsulation has been. I mean. That, that the degradation of materials is the issue with orga all organic electronics, which has been solved by many technological approaches, which uh, are never discussed enough. I mean, most of the devices are um, encapsulated, and uh, there is an entire class of materials that is very seldom discussed in presentation, which is uh, the getters, uh, the materials who are in charge of collecting oxygen uh, to prevent oxygen to uh, photoxidize the active molecules. So this would be the easiest approach. Of course, working with the living system, you can imagine much more. And this is um, one of the reasons why I think that uh, this, could, this approach could uh, enormously impact in, in the future technology, which is, uh, of course, uh, genetically modifying the organism in order to give you uh, all the ingredients you need into the same structure without the need of uh, manipulating it via chemical methods afterward or minimizing the chemical manipulation. So, um, of course, uh, the development of this system is uh, taking uh, the entire part out of the cell membrane because uh, extracting the photoenzyme is much more expensive than synthesizing a polymer for plastic solar cells. So I'm not, I'm not selling uh, here cheap materials or convenient materials, but just a proof of principle. This would become competitive with practical approach or reasonable as a practical approach the day when we will be able to take all the, the system with the membrane and put the system on, on the electrode or even more uh, making the bacterium, the living bacterium, able to um, grow up on the surface of an electrode and developing class of materials that can collect electrons directly out of the bacterium instead of having so many interfaces. So that moment 
uh, will be also the moment where we will be able to um, protect the entire systems against photooxidation, make the system stable and so make the system meaningful in terms of, of production. So uh, the, you can imagine all the possible situation between adding molecules that just prevent oxidation like getters and making the living system able to behave as, as a material and with that bringing with him or with it all the, um, the self-healing ability because what, what the bacterium does in fact and the plant does in fact is continuously self-healing because the molecules are continuously photooxidized so they are continuously replaced by a living cell so the entire genetic machinery is also in charge of self of, of healing the system so that's the way probably Yeah, the they are added during the group. Ah, during this one that eat the, the... Yeah, yeah, sure. This was during the... Yeah, the during the group. So it's inserted inside the Yeah, cell. yeah. What happens is that if you introduce this trialcoxis island group, so the, the, um, since all the cell is always looking for source of silicon, they can also grab the silicon from the glassware. So uh, once they see this uh, alcoxis island group, they immediately uh, convey it to the... To the uh, silicification vesicles where the biosilica is produced. So although I have not um, conclusive proofs, but I'm, I think that probably the molecules are, is eventually covalently uh, attached to the silica uh, structure because of that uh, trinitoxicylin group. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, that, that was the major issue, in fact. Uh, of, uh, so first of all, when, when we do photodegradation on the molecules that has been just grafted by chemical methods, so if I take the silica shell, purify from the living matter, and then I graft the molecule, then if I do the oxidative acidic treatment again, uh, all the organic molecule is bleached because uh, it would not resist that aggressive treatment. When you do the same, uh, once the molecule has, has been embedded in vivo, you know, through adding the molecule to the soil, we don't see significant changes in the, um, in the emission spectrum and in the absorption spectrum, which is an indirect indication that the molecules have survived the chemical treatment. Then we did also some mass spectrometry measurements on the, on the doped silica, and so we have quite conclusive evidences that uh, the molecule is intact. You know, uh, as organic chemists are quite picky about uh, conclusive proofs. So uh, it's reasonably demonstrated that the molecule has not been destroyed, which means that it's very intimately embedded into the silica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, carotenoids, uh, when the, the, the system is the entire living system, they are doing their antioxidant work in, in the classical metabolic way. When you take them out from the cell, just adding carotenoids, I mean, we have not, uh, uh, we have not tried to do that, but uh, it would be like an antioxidant. Uh, we have not tried them. Okay. When you have produced your, your clinic chemistry, how do you, do you attach guacomet frame to the graph? Uh, those are, uh, to be honest, those are molecules which I think are commercially available, those with, where the graphene flakes are already attached to the graphene. But there are plenty of methods where you can exploit the, because th these are um, graphene oxide uh, groups. So graphene oxide, of course, has many functional groups, epoxide groups that you can exploit for doing, for instance, a nucleophilic attach with also organometallic reagents. 
to, to attach the aromatic ring uh, bearing the triple bond. So it's not pure graphene, which would make the functionalization mu much more difficult. It, it reduces graphene oxide. So there are still functional groups around that you can exploit for doing chemistry on top of it. Thank you. Thank you.